Maybe you know, I guess the way you protect yourself from sick. I'm not a betting man, but I bet you were the only one that ever stood out here in the seat. <laughs> yeah, you can probably right. I actually did. A, I actually did a video for the Civil War Trust out here, and I had a coat on once before, but it wasn't the winter. And we did something on the removal of the uh, of the dead. Come on in, you all, and then we can sort of circle around and see some of the ground here in just a moment. We're going to make sure our photographer is with us. She is. Fantastic. I'll let you get set up before I get started here. Thank you, David, huh? Thank you for the humidity. I love the humidity. <laughs> it feels great. There's a place in heaven for you. I heard it's a place in heaven for you. <laughs> well, we'll circulate. We're circling out here so some of you can see down on the ground here in just a moment. Where's my photographer? She all set up. Are you good? Are you good? All right. So first, let's get out our map so you know where you're uh, located. And I would use the map. The second map, I believe. It is the one that reads the fight, fight for Culp Hill, July 2nd. That's in the right hand corner. Battle of Gettysburg, Fight for Culp Hill, July 2nd. If you need a map, I'm happy to give you mine. And so uh, you all are standing. You should have the 
Legend in the upper left hand corner. Legend upper left hand corner. Upper left hand corner. Good? And so, of course, the vegetation makes it impossible for us to see the really distinct difference between upper and lower kelp sill. Upper kelp sill, I suspect you can kind of imagine it, off to your right. And of course, you're well prepared to our guide. I've forgotten the illustrations that huh? brings all this to life. But <laughs> it is on the bus. And as you are resting on the way back to Gaysburg College, you can take those in. Really, really captures this. Again, imagine all the underbrush gone. Off to your right in particular, some big rocks, including the famous rock that Matthew Brady took, the Sharpshooter's Rock. You all ever seen that? How many of you have seen the Sharpshooter's Rock in person? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, if we had time today, it's, fa it's fantastic. You've seen it, haven't you, Al? No, I haven't. We'll do it some Oh, other. man, it's fantastic. Let's go. It's, it's, if we'll we have some time and if you guys are motivated, I'll take you down there. It's a little rough, but I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. So who's yeah. line are we at? That's the thing. You, I, I'm always amazed by these groups. I, I was with Scott Hartwig and we took a bunch of people over to Willoughby Run. We threw down a bunch of boards across the creek and we had some people who I thought, my God, they're going to have a hard time walking across a straight parking lot. And they were right there. So you guys always, yeah, I'm always amazed. Okay, well, if we have some time, we'll go take a look at it. That's just off to our right, the Sharpshooter Rock. So who, what, whose line are we on right now? So we are on the Confederate line, and of course, if you look at your map, we are roughly where the third North Carolina is under Maryland Stewart. Okay. You all see that? Okay, so off to your left would be Lower Culp's Hill, and that, of course, is where the 137th New York is located. And that line, far <coughs> Union right, is, was cracked, yeah, broken, know. and then as you can see from your map, the right, federal right, refused itself, reformed mm -hmm. its position, which of course is outside our line of sight. But on July the 3rd, the attacks are going to resume here, and it's my understanding that the Union artillery on Powers Hill that we talked about, those shells came raining in here. It was a, what you call a mass target, yes? Right? They couldn't actually see the target here. The casualties here, especially on July 3rd, were extreme. Also on Party Field, which is on the other side of Lower Culp's Hill, and the duration of the fighting, I would say it's the very least five hours, maybe pushing six. I don't think that there's another place on the Gettysburg battlefield where you have that duration, that intensity, that longevity of the battle. It's right here. This area, Culp's Hill, was the most visited part of the battlefield well into the early 20th century. Any guesses why? There you go, the bullet holes, that's right. You could take a look at the trees here and you could see the grim effects of warfare. This was the most popular spot, Culp's Hill. Of course, I would say, probably the most forgotten now today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. George Green, we already talked about Green. Yep. Household name. And in fact, back in the day, so the early 20th century, as you took your wagon, or car I guess, up Culp's Hill, what would you see? Green on his monument, towering over the hill. He is the savior of Culp's Hill. But the cars got more powerful. The road couldn't accommodate them. They had to move the park road. Today, when you drive up Culp's Hill, you see George Green? No. See his back. back. You see his butt when you get out of your car, right? <laughs> yeah. That's right. what you see, right? Hey, it's amazing. Yeah. Just a shift in a road has changed our what? Our historical consciousness. Yep. Right? So, we are between those two saddles. We are in the midst of the Confederate assault. Somewhere in this general area, on June, July the 2nd, John Fudge, Charlie Fudge, on the ground, loading their weapons, firing. This is where Charlie Fudge was mortally wounded. John, of course, took him somewhere behind the lines where he passed. When the Confederates, of course, had to abandon this field on the evening of July 3rd and on July the 4th, they left their dead on the ground. And that meant it fell to the victors, the Union Army, to take care of the Union dead. And they had more pressing matters at hand. They had a Confederate Army they needed to pursue. So they, of course, allowed some of their troops to take care of those wounded. A lot of the militia or the Home Guard did it as well. And they did it in a very hasty fashion. As you know, the burial trenches were maybe two to three feet deep. They would place the bodies in central locations, and you were standing at one of those central locations. They had to be efficient, and to be efficient meant getting those bodies to a central location by taking a rope, 
tying it around the legs and the torso and then dragging them to a spot like this. Hmm. Grim work. And of course they lined up the bodies, but to get them lined up like sardines, bodies that had rigor mortis, mm -hmm. you got to start breaking arms and legs to get them to fit in a compact formation. By, Ju by July 7th or 8th, the, what, 7,000 dead or so of Gettysburg <coughs> buried. That quickly surprises a lot of people. But of course, you've got animals running about. Right. Doesn't take much. Rain, a windstorm, and these graves in front of you, of course, become exposed. Showed you yesterday the photograph from the Frazanito book of that lone soldier, assuming it was a Confederate. Couldn't see his face at all. But that was what all Civil War Americans actually feared when this war began. The lone, isolated death. Remember what John Futch wrote to his family, how badly he felt that he couldn't provide a casket for Charlie. That you couldn't hear your soldiers' final words. That they would be buried in a place where no one, friends or family or comrades, would ever see again. Imagine the trauma that these Confederates, that they felt knowing that they were leaving comrades, family members behind here. And you can see, and it's quite amazing, the outlines of these Confederate burial trenches to your front as well as behind you. Gary Edelman showed them to me. There is another depression, as I mentioned to you before, on Lower Culp's Hill behind the Confederate Maryland Monument. Interesting issue, just to contemplate. Obviously, you got to know somebody who knows where to go out here, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Should the Park Service open this up, create a trail? Better yet, put an interpretive marker here, because for most visitors, they believe that the battle ended in July 3rd, and that's it. But of course, it did not. It did not for the soldiers who were the survivors, and it did not for, end for the women who mourned for these men after the war. After the war, Southern women, they claim, we're women. We can't be political. And because we can't be political, we can now make the claim to do what? Bring our dead home. That claim, that assertion was deeply political. Mm -hmm. And they used this in front of you to make that argument. Look what the Yankee vandals did to our dead. Look how they treated them, desecrated them. Bring our boys home. 1873 began a very long process, a very inefficient process of contracting physician here in Gettysburg who had a team of African Americans to reinter the body. I believe they paid, someone can correct me, I think it was three fifty a body. And might have been less. They moved a few thousand, at least about three thousand. Most of them today, ironically enough, in a uh, mass grave, a mass grave in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. There's a huge pyramid there. It's, a, it's quite impressive and well worth visiting. Once again, folks, problem with how we understand Civil War battlefields. We look at the moment, we look at the charge, we often don't take in fully the reverberations. Reverberations for a John and Charlie Futch, a William Wagner. For John Futch, what happened right here behind you? That led, connected to, his decision to desert, and that actually led ultimately to what? His, his execution death. and his death. And then during the Reconstruction, we have again highly political ground. This space should absolutely overwhelm you. But of course, if you come here today, you probably wouldn't know what this represented. And so again, something just to contemplate. Should we bring people back out here? Should we have markers here? Should we help them understand that this sacred ground was deeply political ground? So if you want to take a look around, how are we doing on time here? I want to make sure you guys get ready. Four, Four o'clock. We're pushing things a little bit here. Um, but some of you, especially in the back, you can't really see the outlines of the burial trenches here. This was, I might add, a dumping ground as well. That's why it's, um, you've got that little mound that you all are standing on. Again, if I, if I were to walk out here on my own, I would probably assume that this is some kind of maybe military trench. But we know that, of course, the Confederates didn't do that. So. Farmers dump some things here, but you can still see the outlines uh, uh, right here. Well, I should also add that when they did the reinterment, two things. Many of the farmers 
charge the physician to dig up the body and to move it. So that became costly, and no pun intended here. Uh, the Ladies Memorial Association, Ladies Memorial Association, I think they were from Hollywood, they stiffed the doctor. They didn't pay him. Uh, and ultimately it went into the courts, and it was somewhat resolved in the 1930s. And he didn't get all of his money. He didn't get all, the guy was about $1,000 short. But he leaves some pretty, as you can imagine, pretty grisly descriptions of the work out here. Mm -hmm. uh, was mm -hmm. cremation uh, so unacceptable that even in the case of an enemy you wouldn't think of doing it? I have never ever encountered anyone even suggesting that, but that's an interesting no. point. I, I've that's never encountered question. anyone. What was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. No, was cre no. cremation an option here? And I don't know anything. Uh, 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 hey, one other thing just to note about those photographs of the dead, which are quite powerful, as you know. And again, you know the other thing, I, I, I want to repeat my point from yesterday, that's the nice thing about having the floor again after Tim. I'll, tell, I'll say, you know what, the photographs, they, they deceive the eye, they don't tell us the full story. And one thing they don't tell us, although Tim actually mentioned it, they don't convey the smells and the sounds, mm -hmm. but especially the smells. Those bodies, look at you all, like, yeah, okay, of course they blow me. Wait, you need to remind yourself. These are men who are, not in terms of imposing figures, that most of them don't have that. They certainly though are in coats. They're not nicely fitted like mine, but they are what? <laughs> they are, they're sack coats, right? Mm -hmm. And those coats and those pants are what? They're oh. bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. So, I will head some of you out. Some of you might like to get back to the, to the bus here. A few of you want to take some pictures. And again, I would encourage you to look behind you there. I believe you can still see some of the outlines of the trenches themselves. I wouldn't stray too much around here. It's pretty rugged territory and uh, a lot of poison ivy. A lot yeah. of poison uh, ivy, but yeah, yeah, it's for a good cause if you get How it. Sharpshooters Rock, we'd have to go around to do it. Let me see what the bus is and see how you all are feeling. And we have some time. I, I wish I had the photograph. Oh, wait, I do have the sketch of it. It's pretty cool. I mean, well, let's see what the time is, and again, okay. it'll be an option. An optional tour, no one will be forced to do it. And we can get some more water when we get back. So, feel free, those in the back, if you want to see that, and I will, let me lead us. Get Peter, started, does back. your grade go down if you don't take that tour? Excuse me? Does your grade go down? You, not, you get an incomplete. An incomplete, so you have to come back and do it eventually. <laughs>